this is Jim again at the house at Pooh Corner. And major change of pace today. We're not doing monetary reform. We are doing acting reform. That doesn't make much sense, does it? Uh, we are talking with Peter Boynton, who is the empresario at the Skinner Barn and an actor for most of his life. And we're going to be talking about the kind of training that we have had and because it's been different, I assume, and the, certainly our careers have been different. And uh, I thought that would make for a very interesting conversation for me personally, and hopefully for Peter. And if it's not an interesting conversation for you, then you can turn it off right now. Uh, no, actually, I'm hoping that this will be of some use to budding actors and anybody interested in going into the field, and we'll talk a little bit about what that's like in Vermont, because Peter Boynton runs the Skinner Barn, and I do occasional productions under the name of Ernest Productions. And so I, I'm looking forward to this greatly, and I hope that if you are watching it, you'll tell your friends who are actors that it could be of benefit to them in terms of their uh, skills in particular, I make bold to say, in terms of their acting skills. Uh, so without further adieu, we will uh, go to Peter Boynton and he will tell us about himself and his career and the kind of training that he went through to get where he is, assuming the training was relevant. Yeah, it's probably a little different from yours. It's amazing for actors how varied their backgrounds are. You know, it's not like everyone said at age 10, I want to be an actor, and then all of their training subsequently led to that ultimate goal. I know a lot of actors who had very different ideas of where they were going to end up, myself included. Uh, so first off, hi, I'm Peter Boynton. Uh, Skinner Barn is in Waitsfield, also here in Vermont. Um, my background uh, was all music. Uh, from I grew up outside of Boston in Foxborough, Massachusetts, where the Patriots play. So as you would expect, I'm a rabid Giants fan. <laughs> I don't really like the Patriots. Uh, but in my town, um, there was a very strong music program in my Episcopal church where I grew up. Mm -hmm. So I had a very, very strong, not just um, vocal training, but also theory composition, uh, just unusual talents at the people who led the junior and senior choir uh, in that church. And I wasn't too interested in the, in the services or the religion part of it, but I loved the music part. So when I got out of high school, I went off to college at the uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst and pursued a career in music. I got my degree in theory composition and had the only show I had been in was I was the fourth cowboy from the left in a high school production of Oklahoma. That was it. My older brother was the big actor in the family. He, uh, he played Will Parker and was very interested in theater. Um, so when I was at UMass, I did have the opportunity. I met a couple of students. Uh, Western Massachusetts, there's five colleges there. UMass, Amherst College, Hampshire College, Smith, and Mount Holyoke. And they have what they call a five college exchange. So if you're a student at any one of those schools, uh, if you have the time, uh, you can take a class at any of the other uh, institutions. Mm -hmm. So I happened to be curious and took an acting class at uh, Amherst College and enjoyed it and met some kids from uh, Amherst who had done um, a program called the National Theater Institute, which is in, uh, at the Eugene O'Neill Center in mm -hmm. Connecticut. And basically what it is is uh, college kids from all over the country take one semester off and go to this Eugene O'Neill Theater Center and there's usually a group of about 30 of them. They've done it for decades and they do an intensive theater study working with all professionals from New York. Um, like for movement we worked with Lee Theodore who was from the American Dance Machine. This is back in the day but very famous uh, choreographer. Um, so that was, I decided just to immerse myself in it to see if I kind of liked it and uh, took off the first half of my senior year, 
did that National Theater Institute, or NTI they call it, program, went back and finished up my uh, music study program in that second semester of my senior year and made a decision to go right to New York. And uh, a buddy of mine from UMass was already there. He graduated a year ahead of me. And I had a, an apartment set up with him and just started auditioning. So I really had very limited mm. acting training when I first got into New York, but I worked right away. I was just one of those lucky, I sing well, I'm tall, you know, I had no idea what I was doing, so I was fearless. You know, sometimes when you know a lot about something, you mm -hmm. can really um, tie yourself up mentally, worrying about, am I doing this? I, I had no idea what I was doing. I just went out and was me, which is really the essence of acting, if you can just be yourself and get out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I worked a lot, and I really would have to say that my first jobs, including I did a I got a job right away on a national tour of a production of uh, the musical Cabaret. Even played my old college, at UMass Amherst, <laughs> uh, where in the music department they told me I couldn't sing, which is why I was a theater composition major. Uh, but of course I went back with a lead in a singing role, so that felt great. There's nothing like motivation when someone mm -hmm. tells you, you know, no, you can't do that. Uh, so that's, I always tell the students I've worked with, if someone says, mm, you should think about doing something else, use that as motivation to prove them wrong because that's a big part of any performing is just determination and uh, sticking with it. So um, once I had a few shows under my belt, I think that's when I started to realize, you know, I have some natural affinity for this and uh, I need to learn some technique because when you look at a script and you look at a role and it comes to you, great. <laughs> but what do you do when it doesn't? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're stuck with something, it's like, I have no idea what to do with this. You've got to have some technique. You have to have a road map and some skills as to how to approach um, a part and the work. So that's when I started studying. I went through a, a program with uh, Bill Esper, who teaches the Neighborhood Playhouse. Uh, kind of program. Mm -hmm. um, it's a two-year program. I did the first year of that and was lucky enough to be partnered in that class with people like Jane Summerhays. You can look her up. She was a Broadway actress. Mm -hmm. uh, she was like my acting partner when I'm kind of taking my first acting classes at all. So I'm working with a, I'm teamed up personally with an experienced Broadway actor. She had no idea how um, green I was. Uh, and I learned a ton in a year, and I didn't go back the second year because I got another job that took me out of town. But I continued to, when I was in New York, I was in the city from out of college at 21 until I was 40. So I was there for about 20 years. And all the way until my last show in New York, which was a two-year Broadway run of She Loves Me, if I was between shows, um, or I wasn't doing television work, which I did a fair amount of soap opera work, I was taking classes just because I enjoyed it and it is definitely not a, I've learned it, I'm done, kind of, you know. It's a lifelong, uh, if you're in the performing arts, it's a lifelong um, learning experience, mm -hmm. I think, you know. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm in my mid-60s now and I'm just starting to go, ah, oh, about certain ways to mm -hmm. work or certain things about myself that I go, why do I do that? Or what is that coming from? Or how could I bring that to a part, you mm -hmm. know, to a role? Um, so that's my basic background. I ended up, I had a nice career in New York. I always worked. I did a lot of um, regional theater at Lort Theaters, League of Regional Theater, mm -hmm. Lort. Um, I got to do new productions and get in the Samuel French, you know, first edition. This role first played by, I did some shows at um, the Actors Theater of Louisville, uh, which was awesome. But I got to go around the country doing regional theater and doing uh, national touring, so it's a great way to see the country um, as you're working. And uh, when I made a choice not to go out of town anymore, that's when I started to get more work in New York, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, off-Broadway, Broadway, and eventually, I said to my agent, I think I was about 27, and I said, okay, 
this is great, I work all the time, but I have friends not in the industry who can look ahead and say, hmm, I could get married, I could buy a house, I could have a car, all the sort of things that even as a working actor, you know, you don't make much money. Mm -hmm. I mean, Broadway today, today, these dollars, which is way more than when I was there, you're, it's about $1,900 a week, I think, for equity minimum for a Broadway contract. $1,900 gross before taxes, etc., is nothing if you're living in New York or the New York area, whether mm -hmm. you're in Queens or Brooklyn or Manhattan. Um, so most actors either have, a, in the city, mm -hmm. pursuing a professional <coughs> career, either have a very lean lifestyle um, or a partner who makes money, perhaps, and supports mm -hmm. their artistic endeavors, uh, or and or they're doing many things beyond just theater to make a living. Uh, I always laugh because I did a lot of bartending between jobs when mm -hmm. I was first in the city. And I can remember the first time I got a gig at Actors Theater Louisville, which everyone wanted because it's a great credit on your resume. A lot of shows came out of there and moved to New York. Um, so it's a well-respected theater. And I couldn't wait sometimes to finish what I was doing there and get back to New York because I made a lot more money bartending. Mm. <laughs> so um, it's an interesting profession. You know, yeah. I don't really know your whole arc. You know, uh, for no. me, it was, it was just pretty much either s television, I did some film work and theater work until, my, until I was basically 40, and then I came up here with my daughter to raise my family here. Uh, and of course, in Vermont, uh, you're, it's pretty unlikely someone's gonna piece together a professional career trying to work full-time as an actor. There's just not enough opportunities mm -hmm. nor enough funds. You know? mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there are opportunities to work, <coughs> but not to string them together and make a living, unless mm -hmm. you're teaching or doing some other career and can carve out time for either community theater or the very few professional theater mm -hmm. opportunities in Vermont. They are there, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I don't really know. What? Tell me your art. Well, no, and I didn't know yours, and you didn't know mine. And there's something that I, before I forget, there are two things that I learned personally that I learned much later than you did. What? And one was allowing yourself to shine through the, the character. Yeah. I was always um, afraid of that. Yeah. I thought that it was, it was better to shut that person down and mm. come up with something else. Not consciously, yeah. but I was just subconsciously doing that. And then a fellow actor said to me, you, you're not putting yourself. I was 40, probably, okay. when he said this to me. Okay. Or about that. And I, it, 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 you know, sometimes you hear information and hear it and hear it and hear it, and it just doesn't sink in. Yeah. But it, I was right to hear that at that time. And when you've seen me since. It's like me, no yeah. matter what I layer on. Well, no so Jim has done a few shows at the Skinner Barn. Yes. And uh, you were the old actor for us one year, weren't you too, in the Fantastics? At least one year, I think twice. Twice yeah. I was the old for the, actor. For the Fantastics, and uh, you played the lead grave digger. The Shakespearean actor. In, uh, the, in, in the Fantastics, yeah. and, but also is, uh, Mystery of Edwin Drood was yeah. our grave digger. Mm -hmm. Did you do other shows beyond, what have you done beyond those three? Yeah. Have you done the, something um, with us? The one where I fell off the roof. Oh, uh, Man, Man of La Mancha. Mancha, right, 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 right. It's yeah. a great show. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting what you said about learning to bring yourself to it because what I enjoy about you is you have, you certainly have learned since in the time I've known you, you mm -hmm. had already learned uh, that you are very, you have a very specific personality and I have always felt that that does come out in your performance, mm -hmm. which is what makes you interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the hardest thing for younger actors, they overcomplicate it. You know, it's like you get a script and you look at the part and younger actors are usually trying to put on sort of the wardrobe of that part separately from themselves mm -hmm. as opposed to just saying, 
how do I feel about that? How do I, Peter, mm -hmm. or I, Jim, feel about that? You know, and what would that mean to me? And if it's close to your life, which is when it's easy, mm -hmm. I was talking about technique earlier, mm -hmm. if it's close to your own experiences, it's usually really easy. Yeah. You just let it go, oh, I know what that feels like, I can, I can step into this character. But it's still you and you're drawing from your own experience. Mm -hmm. When you have something that is completely alien mm -hmm. to your experience, that's when it really gets dicey. But to be honest, you don't usually get cast, especially on a professional level, mm -hmm. you don't usually get cast in that role. Mm -hmm. If it's really alien to your experience and it just in the audition process, which is stressful often anyway, it's really obvious, because I've been on the other side of the table, it's really obvious if someone's going to have a natural affinity for a certain role. Mm -hmm. um, so you're usually not going to get that one. Um, but the better actors, actors with training, uh, boy, there's people that have training, you know, uh, much more intensive uh, than what I went through and can stretch. Or they have a facility with, you know, Shakespeare or the classics mm -hmm. or a lot of the theater that doesn't get done as much. You don't have that opportunity as an actor unless you're going through a theater department training yeah. or a prof professional actor training course mm -hmm. uh, somewhere. Everything today is, even from when I started, it's so much more just naturalistic, whether it's mm -hmm. all of these series on you know, Amazon or Netflix or HBO or even what's left of primetime uh, television. There's very little performing in that television medium that isn't just small and totally naturalistic, yeah. you know. Yeah. Whereas, put those actors on stage, and you got to really bump them up because they're mm -hmm. used to, you know, very mm -hmm. small. When I first started doing soap work, I did three soaps, and when I f the first one was One Life to Live, and um, when I first started, they were in rehearsals before you go to taping, they were like, well, you can, you can rein that in a little bit. And I was like, what do you mean? You mean emotionally? Is it, well, no, more physically and how you move and your gestures, because the camera's right there. Mm -hmm. It's actually a three camera setup like this when you do, when we did soap operas. They kind of passed away now, but it's a, what they call a three camera shoot. So, you know, the cameras are, one's like right there, one's like right there. You don't, they don't really want you making too big a movement because they're rarely doing a wide shot. Mm -hmm. So that's very technical. Um, but if you're the, going into that for the first time, it's like you don't know what to do. You, mm -hmm. You've got to hope you've got a good director or your coworkers will say, smaller, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. Um, okay. Most of my experience in Vermont since I've been here, obviously, has been producing, directing, and being in shows at our space and a few other theaters around. I did a few shows at Lost Nation when I first came up. Um, but I'm usually working, especially with younger actors who are coming from a high school experience or whatever, or even the local community theater actors. I'm, I spend most of my trying time to bump up their energy. Yeah. You know, especially, you know, it's like us old farts talking about the kids today, but, you know, they don't know how to project. You know, it's not really mm -hmm. something that's emphasized. Yeah. And Even they don't believe you. That was one of the things that drove me crazy when I yeah. was directing in high school. They simply don't believe you that well, look, the audience isn't going to understand what they're saying. And even look at most high schools now. Even most high school theaters, I'm, I'm around musicals mostly, that's my experience, are miking everything. Unnecessarily. That's we have our space. You know, you work there. It's a it's a hayloft in a barn, four thousand square feet. So it's not a huge space. And as, as long as there's no um, electric instruments like electric bass, electric piano, electric guitar, drums, mm -hmm. some shows require that. So for those, we have to mic the mm -hmm. actors even in a small space. But as long as the accompaniment is acoustic. We can stay away from miking, mm -hmm. which I love. Maybe some area mics just to enhance, but it's, it's as a producer and a director, it's so great to get away completely. Eight minutes and 21 seconds. <laughs> to get away completely mm -hmm. from uh, miking. Yeah. Well, the other thing that I noticed was much different than, than yours is that I was actually told for a while that I couldn't sing. And 
Then I started to get some singing training. And then the same thing that happened, I started to get leads as a singer, and I began to find that I could blow the doors off in terms of volume, but I occasionally, if I was in a production, I worked with Michael May a lot in um, New Jersey. He was the music director for the Masterwork Music and Art Foundation. Okay. So he helped, helped me a lot. I was in some professional productions with him where the audience, after the show was over, I, this was with opera singers. And he said, well, there was you and there was then everybody else because my voice had become something that I had no idea yeah. that it could ever become before. So that was like a, a revelation to me that I had to be told like over and over again that yes, you can, you can do that. Yeah, after being told you couldn't. Yes, after being told that it just wasn't, you know. But I learned how to develop my voice and I was much later. I was in my 40s when I studied in England. We spent three hours, uh, three times a week. Wow. So like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, three hours on voice. And when I got back, my girlfriend said, she just couldn't believe it, that my natural voice sounded like a megaphone. Perfect. And I, I had my teacher there, well, it's not teacher, my acting coach there. Yeah. When we started, he said, well, you don't really have much of a voice as a speaking voice. And now I'm getting over a cold. So sure, yeah. you hear that. But I studied adamantly. And by the time that the six weeks or eight weeks was over, I had a huge voice. There so it shows that the training, if you, you know, if you get it, and yeah. you learn it and you do it, the training can change your whole vocal structure. So I started to teach voice more yeah. after that with some confidence that what I had gone through, other people can go through and people with relatively small voices yeah. can learn how to project and get them out yeah. there. It's so powerful when you can pick up a skill or a technique that you've been told or suspected yourself that you couldn't do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really, the fun thing about the stage is that whether I'm teaching a class or I'm working with high school kids or college kids or a, a, a group of actors that I've cast for a show we're about to do, you know, it's a big leap of faith. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a real, um, on one hand, it's the cliche of like a sports team where you know you really have to have each other's back and you're really only as strong as the weakest link you know all those things those mm -hmm. clichés around teams and sports are equally true for um, a theatrical production to use that specifically but even more than that the fact that you're going to um, reveal yourself if you do get comfortable mm -hmm. letting your personality be uh, shown in front of other people uh, to some people, it's amazing what we do. And I understand that as I get older, mm -hmm. because uh, as you meet more people in life and you're in more circumstances, you realize how unusual that is. Mm -hmm. Actors are a very interesting demographic, mm -hmm. you know, and they're in many ways uh, much more interesting yeah. <laughs> in just it's it's like anything you know if you have you know if you go to a dinner party and there's one person at the table who just is so comfortable and they tell great jokes and the whole place laughs you know that's the natural storyteller in mm -hmm. that group same thing with your family you know there's someone who's usually maybe the kind of the, the storyteller entertainer performer in your little family nucleus nucleus um, it's like that's those are the people that drift towards other people that are also comfortable doing that, and it's interesting when you put them all together. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I don't know. Well, it's, we have a mutual friend. I, she'd probably like it if we said her name, but it, maybe she won't. And she was comparing you and me because she knew us both quite well. Do I know who this is? Oh yeah. Okay. You know her very well, and she said, "Jim, you wrestle apart to the ground, Peter." Is it's easier for him. Okay. He can grab it and and just do it. And um, they said that about Olivier, too. Hmm. Olivier did not just grab a part and run with it. He put on false teeth and he put on makeup and he put on costumes and he experimented. 
And that's what I do. I yeah. experiment sure. with the character. Lots of different voices, different physical things. And I sometimes, I just can't get it. I can't get it. And then it'll come. Yeah. And with Drood, I sensed from the beginning that I, I just wanted to do Michael Caine. Yeah. And I got him down cold, listening and practicing and listening and practicing. And that's why those people came up to you, you told me one day, and, who were English. And she said, well, he's English. You know, everyone else we thought was American, but you've got a, an Englishman in your, in your cast. Yeah. And that's hard work. Yeah. That's, that's not something I just, oh, I'm going to do Michael Caine today. It's very difficult wrestling the part to the ground. See, I get it. Bit by bit. To a point wrestling, you know, there's the great yeah. uh, Marathon Man, the film. <laughs> so everyone mm. knows the story, but yeah. maybe young people don't know this story, but there's mm -hmm. a famous industry story. Mm -hmm. uh, Olivier plays the older villain. The, the dentist, right? The dentist. Yeah. Well, he's the dentist and Nazi, you know, it's yeah. a terrible villain. Right. And Dustin Hoffman plays the young hero, mm -hmm. and he's been abducted. Yeah. And... Laurence Olivier's character is torturing him, drilling through his teeth without Novocaine. You know, it's mm -hmm. terrible. So to prepare for that scene, this is the difference between, um, Olivier talked about as the difference between sort of a British approach, mm -hmm. which is working outside in, mm -hmm. and the method approach of Americans developed at Uta Hagen and all those people in New York, mm -hmm. where it's all interior working its way out. And both styles can work. But in this particular example, Dustin Hoffman had to do this scene where he's getting his tooth drilled. And to prepare for it, he didn't sleep for like three days. He got a cold. And he was physically a mess when they went to shoot it. And uh, they had multiple takes of the scene and couldn't get through it. Yeah. And Olivier looked at Hoffman and said something to the effect of, my dear boy, why don't you try acting? <laughs> I don't remember that part of the story. Yeah. But, uh, and that I, was, I, the point was, you know, yeah. you don't have to actually, it's like Jake LaMotta, De Niro, gaining 60 pounds and injuring mm -hmm. his health to play the role. Mm -hmm. That's quite a commitment, and that's amazing. Mm -hmm. 32 seconds, just so you know. Oh, my God. Okay, and well, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we will continue this conversation. Uh, thank you very much for spending a half hour with us, if you have made it. And um, this is Jim Hogue, House of Pooh Corner. We have been speaking with Peter Boynton. And uh, I'll go further on with uh, some of my training, and we'll see where that goes. So thanks again for listening, and uh, we'll see you right away. Thank you.